Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and we're grateful to have you join us for our traditional worship service. I know that uh, the weather is not looking real good outside, um, so hopefully we will be not only sheltered here, but perhaps you'll be able to make it home after church before the skies open and the rain falls. And so as we worship this morning, we're excited to have you join us, whether you're present here with us or you're watching through technology online or archived, we are grateful to have you be with us. We're going to begin this morning with our call to worship. I invite you to stand as you are able and let us join together with the words you will find on the screens. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We're going to invite you to remain standing as you are able. Our opening hymn this morning from the United Methodist Hymnal is number 548. And this hymn that is entitled, In Christ There Is No East or West, is a wonderful example of the collaboration that happens in Methodism, as originally the music was from an Afro African American spiritual, and then it was worked on again by Harry Burley in 1939. The words originally came from John Oxenham in 1913, and then one of our own paragons of Methodist prayer, Lawrence Hull Stuckey, added verse three in 1987, which comes directly from Galatians. And so as you sing this hymn, you are getting to see the benefits of many spiritual gifts enlivened in one hymn. And let us join together in, in Christ there is no east or west. invite you to remain standing as you are able. Let us join together in the gathering liturgy, which you will find on the screens. God created the world, and every single human being is known to God. Beloved, precious, and of sacred worth are all people. We give thanks to God for those that see and serve beyond the church. Sent into the world in the name of Christ, and bring the love of the body of Christ outside our fellowship. Thanks be to God for those who go forth in service and love. May we edify and encourage them, support them in prayer, and speak out about the value of their ministries and missions. Yes, may they feel our love and love others all the more passionately. Let us join together in our unison prayer. We exalt the Lord and celebrate the good works accomplished by the bestowing of gifts on those who love him. We seek to discern our own gifts and be led to the places where we can best work for the Lord's harvest. Guide and guard us, Lord, Use us according to your will and way. 
May we be allowed to glimpse the glory of following in your footsteps and going forth in faith, hope, and love. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven until Christ comes again in final victory. Amen. Let us join together in the Gloria Patri. Please be seated. Are there any children that wanted to come forward for children's time? Y'all want to come up here? How are you? Has it been a good week? Are we liking school anymore? No? Okay. All right. You know, it's okay. You know, for 40 years, there was a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hello. How are you? So today, um, after if you want to go to children's worship, you go to children's worship. I'm going to be talking to anyone who stays in here about two more spiritual gifts that God gives to us. And one is called compassion. That's the feeling that we have inside when we see someone who is hurt or sick or sad, and it makes us want to help them, right? It makes us want to let them know that we care about them or that we love them and that sort of thing. The other is miracles. Do you know what a miracle is? What's a miracle? Perfect. That is literally the answer. When God does something that no one else can do. Perfect. Awesome. Well done. That is the answer. It is something that only God can do. Now, there are a lot of things that we might think are miracles. Like sometimes people tell me, oh, it's a miracle. I made it to church on time. Well, no, that's not a miracle because other people do that routinely. But Sometimes it feels like a miracle when we're able to do something that we have not felt like we could do before. But God doing a miracle is completely different. I mean, have you ever been out somewhere and you were just able to multiply your food and feed 4,000 people? No. no, that's a God thing, right? Or have you ever been to a party and they ran out of beverages and you could suddenly multiply water into Pepsi? <laughs> no, right? Now, God didn't do Pepsi because he was at a party for 21 and older. He did wine, that's right. And we haven't, we're not able to do that either. And then Jesus was able to repeatedly heal people who were sick. And we have amazing doctors and scientists who have come up with all kinds of ways to help people. But I have even seen where sometimes they say, we've done all that we can do, and yet God can still do more. So miracles are really important. And we need people in the church who recognize miracles, who go, oh my gosh, God's doing something right now. Because unfortunately, a lot of people struggle with whether or not God is still doing anything or with us or active. And so for people who can identify miracles and who can celebrate them, it's really important right now. So I hope that in the next week, you'll look and see. Sometimes we see miracles in nature. Sometimes we see them in our families. Sometimes we hear about them on the news. And if you can identify a place where God is working and doing something that no one else can do, then you are able to identify those miracles as well. Okay? The news does try to scare The news does try to scare you sometimes, doesn't it? Because then you'll watch more news. It's like a whole downward spiral, like the book of Judges, right? And so what we're going to do now is if you would like to go to children's worship, we're going to let you do that. Uh, Miss Mary Lee here will take you, and then she will bring you back before the end of the worship service. Or if you would like to go back to your seats with your families, you can do that as well. And if you change your mind, you can certainly go with her later. All right? What, what do you do there? Well, you get to not listen to me, because sometimes when I go on, it's very long. But um, she has a story for you, and I think she has an activity for you to do as well. And she's kinda a pretty like cool. Yeah, kind of like children's church. We just call it children's worship. Sometimes yes. There's sometimes there's a craft. What do you think? Want to try it? Okay. Are you going to? Ladies, we'll see you in a little bit. They were practicing discernment on whether or not they wanted to go. Okay. All right, and now as we continue in our worship, we're going to have the opportunity to hear our chancel choir's musical offering today. Ferris, Lord Jesus, we love you. So 
Before we hear our scripture this morning, let us take a moment and once more unite our hearts and minds as we go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, we are preparing ourselves in body, mind, and spirit to hear your word spoken and to once more embrace the movement of the Holy Spirit to illuminate for us that which you would have us know. For in the days ahead, there is that which you would have us do. And so we pray that this time with you in the ministry of the word will not only edify and encourage us, but also challenge us and prepare us to go forth and do mighty things in your name. For this is a world, Lord, that needs to know that you are still very much with us and for us. May it be so, in accordance with your will. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. And another, the various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Amen. And I've left something up here that I need for you. Uh, as we have been on this journey about spiritual gifts, we have invited you to partake in the United Methodist Church's developed gift of the spiritual gifts inventory, where the United Methodist Church has outlined 20 different gifts, and they have done this relying on four different New Testament scriptures. One is one of the ones that I just read to you just a moment ago, and these multiple texts talk about what the Holy Spirit is doing in the body of Christ, the church, that the Holy Spirit is giving us these gifts that are to be utilized, as the Apostle Paul says, for the common good. They're not just for us to make a profit or a name for ourselves. They are for us to bless others and therefore be part of God's blessing. And when we are blessing others and we are enjoying God's blessing, we too are blessed. And so God has asked us to not only recognize the gifts that we have been given, but to be committed to using them. Now, there are many other gifts in the life of humankind and other gifts in the church that are not necessarily considered these gifts of the Spirit, but these gifts of the Spirit are vital for the church, especially in this day and age, not just in the early days of Christianity, like when the Apostle Paul was trying to edify and encourage the people of Corinth, but especially now. And the gifts that we're going to talk about today are miracles and compassion. And to help you get a little bit more insight into miracles, our own Mike Micucci, who is our finance chair on the church council, has given his testimony in this video that we're gonna show you now. So I took my spiritual gift inventory a couple months ago, and my particular gift was miracles. And you know, I was asked whether I was surprised or not surprised by that. And uh, kind of in a way I was, but kind of maybe I wasn't. I, I probably thought that leadership would be it because I spent 27 years in the Marine Corps, a uh, lot of leadership positions. But I believe that over time, um, my, my situation has changed. I'm retired now. I spend more time helping others and volunteering. And so miracles and God's work and what he has done to help others is probably more my focus now. One of the things in miracles, I looked on the website and it shows a paragraph of each of the spiritual gifts. And one of the things was that it said that uh, <clears throat> is, is praying for God to work in others' lives and not being surprised when your prayers are fulfilled. And that fits me. As I read more about, my, uh, about the miracles, about my spiritual gift, I kind of looked it up and did a little bit of research. And St. Paul in, uh, Christian theology, he first speaks of miracles uh, in his first epistle to the Corinthians. Um, I believe in miracles, you know, we all are familiar with Jesus's miracles. Um, a miracle being a supernatural act 
brought on by the Holy Spirit. And I think there are miracles every day as we look around. A small seed growing into a beautiful flower um, or growing into a 300-foot redwood tree are miracles for me. So Bart asked me how miracles are a part of my life. And that took a little bit of thinking because I've never seen water turned into wine. And, and so a miracle to me is a pretty significant, significant event. But if you think about it as a supernatural event brought on by the Holy Spirit, I was born, um, I'm a twin, so I was born in 1961. I was six weeks premature. I came in at four pounds, 15 ounces. My brother was five pounds, one ounce. And I spent six weeks in an incubator to continue to develop. And to this day, I'm a very healthy person. I spent 27 years in the Marine Corps. I can run, I can PT, I've got good lungs. Um, and I think it may be more than just 1961 medicine that created what I am today. The other miracle I think about is the miracle of life. Um, me and my wife have two grown boys. They've grown up to be great men. Um, my oldest son lives in Charlottesville and he has two, uh, two children, so we have two grandchildren. And what I see is, you know, we all who have had children have seen our kids grow up, and it is the miracle of life. But to see your grandchildren grow up, to be one generation away, and for example, our granddaughter is two years old, and so she, she's going from an infant to a toddler, and just watching her develop to get her own ideas, her own thoughts, she's starting to speak. Um, it's, it's really just the miracle of life. I'm grateful for Mike to delve a little bit deeper because I remember when he told me what his spiritual gifts were he was like am I supposed to be performing miracles is that what God is asking me to do no no if you got miracles it's okay you're not a failure what is happening is that the gift of miracles is not about performing miracles but about living into the miraculous reality of God's creation those gifted with miracles never doubt the power of God and the presence of God in creation. They are able to help others see and believe in God's power. The gift of miracles does not focus on the extraordinary alone, but sees the miraculous and the mundane and the normal. Living in the spirit of the miraculous, people see God in nature, in relationships, in kind acts, and in the power of love. So miracles are really important because it's those that are able to recognize and to give glory, to name, to testify, and to kind of call out where the miracles are still happening. It's a shame the downward trajectory of a lot of belief in miracles. So I went online and I found this research from Gallup that was published in December of 2021. So this is at the end of 2021. We were already in the midst of a pandemic and they begin their research several years out before they publish it. And so you had some pre-pandemic research and some mid-pandemic research. But this is what Gallup discovered, that as of the end of 2021, 69% of Americans identified as Christian. That includes people who consider themselves various denominations and families within Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, uh, non-denominational, or just generically Christian. 7% of Americans identified themselves as non-Christian. So this would include the other world religions, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, other forms of religion that might be more minor um, in, in the representation in the world and in the United States. 21% said they had no religion. And 3% didn't even respond. So almost a quarter of America does not have any kind of understanding or identity of themselves as religious or working their spirituality out in their communities or in their understanding of how their life has that kind of purpose of connection with other people. And that's huge because things have been changing. In 1971, 90% of Americans identified as Christian and only 4% said they didn't have a religion. Only 22% of Americans report attending worship every week. Only 22% of Christians in this country attend worship every week. And only 25% say that they do it seldomly. You know, these might be people who do it sporadically, maybe Christmas, maybe Easter, but they would re refer to themselves as seldom attenders. 31% never attend worship. More than half of Americans either irregularly, seldomly, 
or never go to worship. And that is a tragedy because worship is where we not only encounter God, but where will you get to experience something that is the embodiment, the foundation of a lot of Christian theology, and that is the triune God being present. When we gather together, as long as there's two or more of us, Jesus is with us. We have God the Son with us. When we gather together, because this is an apostolic church and we believe that the Holy Spirit has not only been present with the church, but upon us through the sacrament of baptism and through the gift of God and through the continued gathering together, which knits us and connects us and allows us to feel that movement of God, not only within, but between us, then we have God the Holy Spirit. And any time in Christianity that we are gathered in sacralized space, whether it is permanently consecrated, as this sanctuary is, or whether it's temporarily consecrated, like our siblings in Christ who might be worshiping in a building that they don't own, like those that worship in a, in a school that is closed on Sundays but available to them, they are temporarily sacralizing that space and inviting God the Father to dwell in the midst of that worship. So when you come to worship, you are in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Most of Christianity apparently doesn't experience that. And yet you do. And why is that important? Because God has revealed God's self to us in community. The three persons of the Trinity are in relationship with each other. They not only reveal to us God's self, but they also show us how God chooses to interact with God's self and us. And we, we deny ourselves that when we don't have a religious expression such as worship. We deny that. And then what we hear and experience and offer in worship is becoming part of who we are when we go forth into the world. But if you don't get that, then you are losing something. Because it has been my experience, and this is purely anecdotal, but very few Christians will strive to be better if there's no level of accountability. I mean, how many of you picked up a book by Niebuhr in the past week? Anybody a disciple of Bonhoeffer? Probably not. Because if you don't have the community and you don't have the outpouring that happens in worship from the ministry of the word to the ministry of music to the prayer and the collegiality that comes with being in the body of Christ, very few of us will do that on our own and never to the same extent as what happens when we gather together. That's why Jesus made the apostles gather together. That's why he made us come together for worship. Because even back in the Old Testament, God the Father recognized if you don't make them ever come home, they won't. They'll get busy with their lives. They'll get caught up in their own agenda. They need to come. Because when we come to worship, we are not here to be selfish. We are here to worship God. We are actually here to set aside ourselves and be the embodiment of gratitude. And when you empty yourself of your own desires and wants, God can fill you up with the gifts and the spirit and the gratitude and the power that you need to go forth and really be a better disciple than you were when you came before. And so worship is crucial. And having people who are in the body of Christ gathering for worship, who recognize miracles, is important. We live in a world where more and more Christians do not believe that God is doing anything. We live in a world where people think that God created this incredible world, spun the earth around, and walked away, washing God's hands of us. Now, why do they think that? I mean, as one of our youngest and brightest just said, if you watch the news, you get a little afraid. Yeah, because the world looks like it's in a bit of a mess, or as my grandfather used to say, going to hell in a handbasket. And you look at it, and it's intimidating, it's frightening. But I have to tell you, my siblings in Christ, our siblings in Christ have felt this way since the day Jesus ascended. It didn't take very long. In fact, right after the crucifixion, Jesus is constantly like, get out of the upper room. Come back into the world. Come back into the world. Get out of here. Because we have a tendency to become afraid and fearful. And instead, Jesus was trying to tell them, even before he ascended, that we need to trust God. We've got to trust God. 
There has never been a time that Christians haven't had to endure some of the most atrocious aspects of living in this world. From the very beginning, they were villainized, they were persecuted. There is independent documentation from the Roman Empire that they used to use Christians to torment and murder as entertainment in the Colosseum. I'm sure those people who were around the Roman Empire were terrified and thinking, surely Jesus is coming back because this is horrible. And there has been no era in the world since Christ ascended that Christians have not had to live through, endure, and find ways to survive and then thrive in world wars, civil wars, plagues, natural disasters, turnover in politics, genocides, and every generation would be completely understood if they turned around and said, this has to be the end times. We have been wrong for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, Christians have thought the end is coming. For 2,000 years, God has been working miracles in this world. Have we noticed? Are we paying attention and are we giving glory to God for what God has done? And Mike was exactly right. Sometimes the miracles seem to be big. I mean, they seem to be echoes of what we read in the scriptures. The miraculous healings that Jesus performed. People who had been blind since birth that could see because of the touch of his hand. People who had been disabled or had been lifelong handicapped who were then empowered and they could walk. He cleansed the lepers of their disease. He saved people. He resurrected the dead. And yes, those are amazing miracles. But what we often overlook that people who are gifted with the spiritual gift of miracles don't overlook is that we are called to participate and to respond. Jesus doesn't just show up and be like, you walk, you see. You'll notice that in all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus is about to perform a miracle, he usually calls to the person, come here, and they respond. They come, and then they receive. Or he has a conversation with them. What is it that you want? Tell me what you want. And Jesus will heal them or help them. I mean, even the turning water into wine happens because multiple people trust in Jesus and listen to what he says in order to actualize that first miracle that's recorded in the gospel account of John. Jesus is at a wedding. It's not his wedding. Apparently, it's not part of anybody that they actually know uh, as in family, but it's, they've been invited. His mom's there, and he and the apostles are there. And the, the biggest shame of every reception is that the wine's run out, which means the party's about to close. And his mother comes up to him, and she says, um, they're almost out of wine, to which Jesus infamously responds, woman, what do you want me to do about that? Mary wasn't done. She wasn't ready for that party to end. And so she doesn't say anything else to Jesus. She turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And they do. Jesus is not someone they should have listened to, but they're going to listen to his mama just like he is. And so they have these large jars that probably stood from here to the floor of the chancel. And they had been filled with water so that the guests, as they arrived, they could ceremoniously wash their hands and clean their feet before they went in for the ceremony and the celebration afterwards. And so Jesus says to the servants, fill them again. And based upon the archaeological evidence we have of the size of those containers and what the scriptures tell us, at the very minimum... Jesus transforms water into wine 150 gallons worth. That's an open bar party. Because a wedding is worth celebrating according to the scriptures. And so I'm sure Mary was very happy. I hope somebody carried Mary home. And the party went on. But if she hadn't had the trust in Jesus, if she hadn't told the servants to listen to him, and if they hadn't listened that party would close down. 
I mean, think about how many people were participating in them. We talk about the feeding of the thousands, which happens multiple times according to the four gospel accounts. And in one of them, the one that we most often talk about and the one that we probably like the best, Jesus says to the the apostles after they say to him, it's getting late and you need to send these people off so that they can go find food and eat because that's the compassionate thing to do. And Jesus says, "Hmm, you feed them which starts inner anxiety and panic in about 12 grown men. But there's a little boy. There's a young man who is there and who responds to the need, says, I have a lunch. It's just some fish and some bread, but I'll give it to you. And from his willingness to respond, to present what he has, to offer it up, Jesus feeds thousands and thousands of people. Jesus didn't just clap his hands and it rained manna. He took what that young person had and made it more than enough. We have to participate in these things. How many times have you just met people that are waiting for a miracle? Are you praying? Are you praying together? Are you discerning together? What are you doing? What are you doing to participate in it? Are you gathering for worship and calling out to God? Are you reading the scriptures where miracles happen? What are you doing to be a part of this? And people gifted with miracles are the people that help us see what is going on. They're the ones. Because sometimes other people will take credit for God's miracles. There are plenty of people in this world, whether they're right or wrong or criminal, who will try to take credit for what God did. And people with miracles are like, no, 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 no. You're good, but you're not God. That's God at work right there. I know that's God at work. Now, medicine has come a long way. But because of my proximity to the medical profession, because of what I do, I can tell you right now, I have seen over a dozen times where science and medicine have thrown up their hands in defeat and said, we've done all that we can do. Yesterday, here in this sanctuary, we had a service of death and resurrection in honor of a man who had been told he had six to nine months to live three years ago. He outlived hospice several times. That's some glory for God right there. Because when they put you on hospice, medicine has said, we're done. We can't do anything else. And I have seen three people now outlive hospice. Not once, not twice. One woman did it three times. Hospice was like, are you serious this time? Because God is not ready for her to go. Yes, God does those things. And it's not just the big things like You shouldn't have been able to be cured of cancer or this heart surgery. We couldn't even do it, and yet your heart has repaired. It's not even those things. It is some of the littler things in life where you're like, oh my gosh, I can see that God was at work here. And no matter how much we as human beings tried to make this happen, it just wouldn't happen until we let go and let God. And we responded. So miracles are important, but they also rely on people who have compassion. What is compassion? The gift of compassion moves people to action on behalf of those in need. Compassion is not a simple caring about others. It's not just empathy, but such a radical caring that we have no choice but to make sacrifices for others. Those with the gift of compassion rarely ask, should I help, but instead focus on how to help. Compassion makes us fundamentally aware of the Christ in others and springs from our desire to care for all of God's creatures and creation. We need those people with compassion. Now, I know you think like all all of us are supposed to have compassion. Yes, okay, we should be cultivating compassion, especially if we want that heart of Christ that Paul writes about repeatedly. However, there are some people who are specifically gifted with compassion. In the United Methodist Church, we have two orders for ordination. The first is elder which I am, as evidenced by my broad stole here. The other are deacons. We are co-equal in ministry, but we have different gifts and different functions within the church. Both of us are ordained to service and word, but the elder is ordained to order and sacrament, and the deacon is ordained to compassion and justice. Because deacons are the ones that are bridging what happens here in the church, which is overseen by the elder, with the needs of the world. 
Deacons are those who are motivated to figure out how to make these things happen, and they are gifted by the Holy Spirit to do it. But it's not just ordained deacons. You need Christians in every small group, in every ministry, in every church who have compassion. Otherwise, you get this. Have you ever watched a massive natural disaster or a truly tragic, violent eruption on the news and thought to yourself, dear God, what can I do? And you have felt yourself going, I can't do anything. People gifted with compassion don't hear that response. And they won't let others say it and rest. Instead, these are the people that figure out how to make it happen. I suspect that if we go back into the history of UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, we will find out that people who were gifted by the Holy Spirit with compassion made that happen. Because they wouldn't take no for an answer. They wouldn't let the rest of us become paralyzed and inept with fear. Instead, they acted. Now, fear can paralyze us in a lot of ways. I mean, it, sometimes it just happens. When I was growing up, my sister and I are about 10 years apart. We are very different people. If she was standing with me right now, you would never believe that we were sisters. We don't look alike. I look like my dad's side of the family. She looks like my mom's side of the family. We are very different in just about everything. We're both white women. That's about it. That's about it. And being the firstborn, I had certain propensities and certain gifts and, and ways of doing things. For instance, being the firstborn and then having a, a little sibling who's almost 10 years younger, you become really quick at, here's the problem, how do we get to the solution? How do we fix it like now? You get good at that. And so you start to track how you're going to fix things. It becomes very practical on how you're going to get things done. Hence, there's a lot of people in leadership who were firstborn, because you know what? You had to. But then you have people like my sister, and my sister has ADHD, and we didn't realize at the time, but my sister becomes overwhelmed with the scope of certain projects. If my room's a mess, I'm going to clean it up. We're going to get it done, we're going to get it done now, and then we're over it. Moving on. My sister would look at her room, and she was actually telling me this story this past week. I would look at my room, and I would just see this unending mess and there was nowhere to start, and so I might start, and then I would just be like, oh, I haven't played with this in a while. And then I said, but that doesn't explain how it got worse. Like, how does it get worse? Like, I don't understand. And she's like, because I just become like that. Now, thankfully, my sister has had incredible medication and therapy and, and life skills given to her, and she has developed patterns so that now that doesn't happen. And in fact, she has been on this, like, this go get them mindset recently and she was telling me that she and her husband had gone into this room to clean this room together that really needed you know to be cleansed and expunged and you know get the demons out whatever was happening and she said that there was this box and her husband picked up the box and he goes here let's work on this and she goes don't open that box she goes i'm telling you right now i know what's in that box and if you open that box i will become totally distracted and nothing will get done don't open the box and i was like what in god's name was in the box and she's like, it had like a bunch of memories and like, you know, nostalgia items in it. She said, and I knew that if he opened it, I would become like drugged down into that and I couldn't focus on the task at hand. First of all, go Katie that you recognize when you've got like a stumbling block ahead of you and go Katie for not falling into it. Like, good job. And I was like, did he open the box? She's like, no, because I was like, if you open it, I'll kill you. <laughs> like, cool, okay. But she had to learn coping mechanisms because it didn't come innately. And the church is called to be compassionate. Compassion is the inward fuel that is the catalyst for acts of mercy. And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy. Because sometimes acts of mercy are a sacrifice. They are. I mean, Jesus calls forth acts of kindness. What is it that fuels kindness? Internal love. And God needs us to continue to nurture those things so that we can act when the time is right. And hopefully, one day, a church will become so ingrained in its gifts and in what we are called to do that we won't just react when something happens. We won't just compassionately respond. We will get to the point where we actually get preemptive, where we can see things coming and we can figure out how to be there. You ever watched a parent when they take their toddler out for the first time and let them kind of walk out in public? If you ever get in spring and you go down to the downtown mall, get an outdoor seat and just watch. 
right? Because first of all, a lot of like obstacles on the downtown mall, right? And the kid is just like trying just to walk, trying just to walk. And you almost always hear one of the parents say this, don't get too far ahead. Because what happens if you get too far ahead? If you start to stumble, I can't catch you. If you fall down, it's going to take me time to get to you. If you veer off on the side, you might think that you're lost and alone and abandoned. But you've got to keep up. Let's stay together. And God has been asking for that in relationship. Let us stay together. Don't get too far ahead because sometimes we get so far ahead because we think that we got it now. Okay, thanks, God. I'm good. Sometimes we get too far ahead and we're leaving the other people behind. You can't get too excited about a ministry and leave the compassionate person that got the thing started in your midst, right? You gotta like keep going. You have to stay together. And God has been asking for that. People who are gifted with miracles and compassion have to stay connected to God through their spiritual disciplines, through their um, ordinances that they take part in, whether it's Bible study and worship and hopefully all of these things, that they use these things so that they can stay aware and alert and ready to use their gift. I had a lot of people from our staff and our leadership on the church council come up with miracles. There were a lot of people that were like, am I supposed to be performing miracles? No, it's okay. I mean, if you can, that'd be awesome. But no, that's not what we're asking for. We are asking for people who trust God enough to say, we can try this. We can try. Because I was born and raised in the United Methodist Church, and I've been to a lot of churches, both as a lay person and as a pastor, and, I, and even outside of Methodism, this isn't just a Methodism thing, I think this is probably a human thing, but it's definitely a Christian thing. Have you ever been on a committee or in a small group or on an admin board or a church council, and you heard somebody say, that'll never work? Not going to happen. Nope, can't do it. We tried it once and it didn't work. We tried. You tried or you tried with God? Because maybe you try, but now God's ready to be with you and do it. You have those people, and they're practical. They're not mean-spirited. They're trying to figure it out. But what we need is we need somebody that goes, God is going to be with us. God's going to try. You know, we're here. We can try this. You know, you need that faith of Peter. One of the greatest miracles that Peter gets to experience is the one that's about him where he sees Jesus. You know, there's all these stories of the apostles in a boat, on the sea, sometimes overnight. There's waves and storms, and they just scream like little girls in the scripture. Just like, I was like, weren't, weren't like a third of you fishermen? Like, what happened here? Instead, they get very upset at night, and there's one of the stories where it's a storm, they're all terrified, and Jesus is walking on the water toward them. First, they think he's a ghost, which just elevates the panic. And then all of a sudden, one of them goes, wait, I think that's Jesus. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you, command me to walk on the water to you. Faith. He believes that Jesus can make him do things. He says that. Here is what I want. Help me to walk on the water. And what does Jesus say? Come. He gets out of the boat, out of that symbol of safety and protection and last resort against drowning in the sea. He gets out of the boat and he starts to walk. He starts to do it. And the, the scripture moves too fast because really he moves so far and, and gets so close to Jesus that what happens is that eventually he's so far away from the boat, but he's almost on top of Jesus. And then all of a sudden he stops paying attention and focusing on Jesus and he starts to let the world creep in. The waves and the darkness and the wind and the fear and the storm, all of that starts to encroach on his vision. And when he stops looking at Jesus and he stops paying attention and believing, that's when he starts to sink. He starts to fail. But he is so close to Jesus that according to the text, Jesus reaches out and grabs him immediately, to quote the scripture, immediately. That's how close he was. And Jesus picks him up and Jesus says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Look how far you've come. Why did you doubt? People with miracles and compassion believe. They believe that God does miracles. They believe that we can respond when people are in need. And we need that. 
because the rest of us will become as mired in anxiety and fear and not knowing what to do as my sister as a child in that cacophonic mess that was her room. And God didn't want that for us. God wanted us to have people that could help us see through the mire, the bureaucracy, the red tape, the doubt, the fear, overcoming obstacles that we can't even figure out what they are yet. That is the gift of miracles and compassion. And they aren't my gifts. So when I figure out there are people with miracles and I feel like, figure out there are people who have compassion as their spiritual gifts, those are the people that I'm looking to in a time of need. Those are the people that I go, I need to step back so that they can step up because they're not always the most outspoken, loud people. But both of those are gifts of outreach. They are gifts of testimony. Compassion literally reaches out to those who need help and miracles reaches out to people to testify to God. Sometimes it's like, here, I see God working in you. I see God working in this. I see that God has been doing things. Could you imagine what the scriptures would be if there were no testimonies to what God was actually doing? It'd be a very boring genealogy. But instead, the Holy Bible is filled with testimony among testimony among testimony of people who experience God doing things, active, engaged, responding, sometimes preemptively. We would call that prevenient grace, that God is doing things. And that's why these gifts are so important, because without them, the other gifts won't know where to go and what to do. And so your gifts are important. They're so vital. We need them. The world needs them. The next time you ever hear anybody that says something like, I, I, don't, even, I don't even know that God cares. I, I don't even know where God is in all of this. They are crying out for somebody with the gift of miracles to show them where God is. And the next time you hear somebody who is so hopeless my finances have completely deteriorated. My relationship has been so torn asunder, it is not even repairable. The circumstances of my life are insurmountable. Those are people who are yearning in the depths of their being for someone gifted with compassion to find a way. To find a way. And so, yes, these gifts are the very foundation of an effective church. And I'll tell you, I have seen miracles. I have seen them. I have seen things that I thought would never happen. I have seen things that other people thought could never happen. But I'll tell you what, I have seen this church perform a miracle. Before the pandemic, some of you will remember when we had an Advent Christmas offering for RIP Medical Debt Relief. We were going to raise, they had given us the amount of $20,000 to raise. At the end of the fiscal year, when everybody's trying to buy presents for Christmas, they wanted us to raise more than twice what we had ever taken in ever. They wanted us to raise $20,000. And I was like, um, that doesn't seem reasonable, but fine. Well, <laughs> we'll throw that out and see how that happens. Because we were going to take that money and then turn it over to RIP Medical Debt Relief, who buy up medical debt. Just like a third party collection agency, you can buy up debt for pennies on the dollar and generally a collection agency will actually try to recoup some of that. If you bought it for three cents on the dollar and you're able to get even half of it back, you've made a pretty good profit. And since my first job after babysitting and nannying was a bill collector, this was especially interesting to me. Because I said to them, I said, how does this work? You bought up the debt and then what are you gonna do? And they said, we're gonna forgive it. Like that, you're just gonna write it off. Yeah. Come on back in, ladies. And so we got through Advent, four Sundays of Advent. We got through Christmas Eve. I think that year it was four worship services. We got through Christmas Day, one service on Christmas Day. And then we got to the next week, and there was $22,000 that had been given. Twenty-two. I don't know who gave the extra two, but like, boy, did you show me up. $22,000. And then when I turned it over to RIP Medical Debt Relief, they forgave $2.2 million dollars of medical debt. One person had six figures of medical debt. 
I wish I could have seen that person's face when they went to go get the mail, and inside was a letter from RIP Medical Debt Relief that says that courtesy of Crozet United Methodist Church, your medical debt is gone. Gone. I hope they didn't have a heart attack. I don't know what I would do with that. I know what I make, and I don't know that I could ever overcome six figures of medical debt relief. But you did. This church, this body of Christ did. And I refuse to believe that our best days are behind us. I don't believe that. First of all, I know that we serve a God who makes all things new. I also know that we serve a Savior who says the best is yet to come because I haven't come back yet. So I know that we have our best days ahead of us. And I know Gallup's going to tell you we're in decline. I know that the world is going to tell you that you have had your golden era and it's over. But you know what? The world's been wrong before. Because we are not done. And when you use your gifts, when you recognize and then you use your gifts in your lives, in ministry, in mission, and selflessly for the common good, says the Apostle Paul, then yes, we can do anything. And we shall. We shall. Because this is what God wants. This is what the world needs. And my siblings in Christ, is this not who we were redeemed to be? May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. In a moment, we are going to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, and it's an opportunity to remember that God has given us things that with trust and faith we can turn, and they too can become a blessing for others and speak volumes about our faith in God. So let us worship the Lord with our tithes. Please rise for the doxology. trust these things into your mighty and capable hands, and we beseech you to transform them into the means that will fuel miracles and that will help us reach out in care and concern, embodying our compassion and become true acts of mercy to share with those who so desperately need and want your love. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. 
I have just a couple quick announcements for you. We launched today our high school Bible study in between worship services, and it was wonderful to have um, our youth there. It helps that one of our adults works at Bodo's and brought bagels, so, you know, that was a good thing. Um, bagels and Bibles, they go together so nice. Uh, but we're going to also continue this, so it'll be meeting for about 20, 25 minutes on Sunday mornings between worship services, and then in the evenings on Wednesdays and Zoom. And right now we've got it from 6.30 to 7, but the feedback from the youth is 7 to 7.30 will work better, but. Um, if you have a youth that's interested in being a part of that, reach out to me and I'll make sure that you get the link and get the correct time that we go forward with. And then Impact is our social justice ministry here at the church where we join together with 25 other congregations and religious groups from across Charlottesville and Albemarle County. We're beginning our new annual, well, it's not new, but it's the annual uh, routine that we have. It starts with the meetings, the small group meetings, where people are invited to think about the places where they have seen struggle in our communities and their loved ones and their neighbors and sharing those stories so that we can all discern together where God is calling us to use our gifts and our influence to help resolve these issues. So the meetings will be meeting here in our church in the fellowship hall. We have them on Saturdays and Sundays upcoming in September. Saturday, September 16th from 1030 to 12. Sunday, September 17th from 1215 to 145. Sunday, September 24th from 1215 to 145 and Saturday, September 30th from 10.30 to 12. And if, you have the, if you've been moved by something that you've seen and you don't know how to fix it or how to address it, then this is a perfect time to share that story because those who are given the gift of compassion are working actively to fix these things. So you can attend any one of those sessions that you would like. You don't have to be a network member to do that. We are looking for the widest variety of stories to be shared. You can reach out to Leela Law for more information and we have her email address for you. You can also contact us at the church office and we will connect you. And then our SEED, the, the children's group for third, fourth, and fifth graders launched this past week. Um, and we will be meeting again this Wednesday. Our group runs from 4 to 5 p.m. for the program, and this week is games. And then we're going to have dinner from 5 to 5.30. We had pizza last week. This week we're doing tacos and nachos. So we would love to have our third, fourth, and fifth graders come and be a part of that. I'm running that. So if you have questions, reach out to me, Pastor Sarah at CrozetUnitedMethodist.org. Our church hours are shifting because we're running more programming in the afternoon and the evening now. And so our church office hours are still going to be open Monday through Thursday. But starting Monday, September 11th, it's going to be open from 10 to 2 instead of 9 to noon. So it'll be open a little bit later. And then my hours will now be Monday through Thursday from 2 to 6 that I'll be here in the building. So you'll actually have a larger breadth that staff will be here in the church and can help you. Um, and we are also trying to make sure that we are doing our best practices for handling our money and our gifts that are brought to us. So we're looking for congregation members who would be part of the counting team, whether it's the team after 9 o'clock or after 11 o'clock. Best practices say that we should have two individuals not from the same household to do that, and we were very good about that before the pandemic. We need to just make sure that we return to our best practices. So if you would like to be a part of that, you do not have to be a CPA to do this. Um, but you, we actually just need two people to be a part of that. So if you would be willing to be one of those people, please reach out to Debbie at office at crozetunitedmethodist.org, and she'll make sure that she reaches out with you and connects with you and lets you know what exactly is needed. And she's already streamlined that process. So for those of you that have done it in the past, if you want to jump back in on it, you will be very pleased. And then speaking of giving, our church council has continued to strive to communicate openly and regularly about the current state of giving and spending in our church for accountability purposes. You can find updated numbers each week in the bulletin by using the QR code in the pew. You're welcome to reach out to us in the church office if you need it in another format. And I know that Mike Micucci would be happy to talk to you and answer any questions that you may have. And then very quickly, our United Women in Faith have their yard and bake sale on September 23rd. Our middle school youth group will meet tonight at 5 30 p.m. and Monday night is missions and merriment and we're so grateful for all the things that are happening in the life of our church and for all of you. So now we're going to invite you to stand as you are able. Let us sing together our closing hymn from the United Methodist Hymnal number 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
this benediction. As you prepare to leave this place, keep your eyes open for the work of God in this world, the miracles that happen, and with the heart of Jesus Christ, may you find the compassion overflowing in you to respond with acts of mercy and to respond because of love with acts of kindness. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen.